I knew the poems from uh, when my mum used to read them to me when I was a kid. I, I can't speak for Andrew Lloyd Webber, but he must have noticed something of the theatrical in all of Eliot's poetry. Eliot's first marriage to Vivian Haig Wood was a whirlwind romance, and she was obviously quite unhinged in many respects. So their marriage began to disintegrate, but theirs, theirs went spectacularly off the rails. And by the end, she was in fact sectioned and died in a, in a, in a mental home. It's such a sad end. And as he said many years later, the marriage brought to her no happiness, and to him it brought the state of mind out of which came the wasteland. I feel that Eliot was closed to human love for a lot of his life, partly because his first marriage was such a disaster. The real break seems to come in the 50s when he meets Valerie. Behind the mask, the massive masks, there was a frivolity and a, and a joie de vivre, which Valerie unlocked. Eliot is a man who writes through agonies. I mean, Eliot was a towering figure in both poetry, literature, and, dare I say, culture in the 20th century. There's no one like him. He's, OK, he's part American, part English, but he was based in England, and he's absolutely unique. You know, Eliot came from a very constricted emotional background. Eliot's upbringing really instills in him this sense of a sort of almost Puritan duty in the, the goodness of work. I think of that little story about Eliot as a child. And of course, over the very high back wall is the Mary Institute, the, the girls' school that was founded by his grandfather. And Eliot talks about being able to hear the boisterous, female, sociable sounds of the playground and, and the laughter of the, the children in it. And this is a a world that he finds both beguiling and perhaps slightly frightening, and yet is always excluded from it. I think you can look at Eliot as a person who was trapped by the morality of his times, but also who in many ways transcended it. He came to Oxford to study at Merton College and to do a year of philosophy um, after he uh, had finished three years as a graduate student at Harvard. And I think that at that point, he was in love with a young woman called Emily Hale, who came from the same background as he did. He declared his love, and she didn't appear to him to return it. So I think that Emily Hale lingers in his mind. About two months later, in the next university vacation, he meets a young woman of his own age, Vivian Haywood, who is very advanced, as she's got strong opinions, and they're very honest opinions. What is crucial to Eliot is that he, she's very really responsive to his poetry. He was essentially an Edwardian poet. Think, you know, Rupert Brooke, Edward Thomas. He's, you know, the, the new tune of all time. He's absolutely... The love song Alfred Drake, J. Prufrock is the most extraordinary innovation in departure. It is staggeringly original in those times. The reason why we still read Eliot um, is because of the, the rhythm and the pacing of the writing. He's an, he's an absolute genius when it comes to using the pace of a life. But the, one of the other things that um, he is incredibly good at is producing uh, really arresting imagery. So that poem begins with let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. So that image of the patient etherized, literally drugged, laying out prone on a slab. It's a complete shock. You're expecting some sort of elevated, romanticized image of the evening sky, and he absolutely breaks that expectation. So he's a great, great and innovative poet. His friend Ezra Pound said the only job of a poet was to be original, make it new. And Eliot was making it new on a colossal scale. 
He cultivates Elliot. He sees Elliot's genius in the early teens when the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock comes to him. He understands that Elliot is really even a greater poet than he is, and that's not easy for Ezra Pound, I think, to admit. Pound says, look, if you want to make it as an American writer, you have to make it in London first. Now, Elliot is very like Prufrock in some ways. For I have known them all already, known them all. Have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. That he's measuring out his life with coffee spoons. Um, and, and the wish, the deep buried wish to utter an overwhelming question. Do I dare? Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. Right at the very end of Prufrock, there's a moment where we, t we turn to the mermaids and Prufrock says, I can hear the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. And it just seems to me that this is this exquisite moment where we acknowledge the failure of communication, the inability to reach that, that moment of joy. Um, and yet, by virtue of Prufrock talking about this moment, the mermaids, they might not sing to him, they might not sing to us, but we hear them, nevertheless. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I mean, he came to England to study philosophy. He read a book by Simmons, which was about French symbolist poetry. The French symbolists were writing in the late 19th century. And he suddenly became very, very interested in French poetry. It's partly why he goes to study in Paris. And he starts writing in the style of Jules Lafourgue in particular. And that's what produces the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. His first great poem to be published, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, is published the month he marries Vivian. Eliot's first marriage to Vivian Haig Wood was a whirlwind romance. What took place on the 26th of June, 1915, was this impulsive marriage where neither party told their parents. They went to the Hampstead Registry office with two witnesses and the deed was done. He was a young man and she was obviously quite unhinged in many respects. It's not really clear that either is what we would say in love with the other. I mean, they're drawn to one another. There seems to be some kind of real attraction that other people noticed. And Vivian was, I mean, it sounds so, so minor to say she was a great supporter of Eliot's, but she really believed in his greatness. I think that it was overwhelming to Eliot that here's somebody who wants him to be a poet. And if he married her, he wouldn't go back to America. He had an unerring instinct for what he needed to do in order to be the poet that he wanted to be. And that included really breaking away from, breaking out of his establishment, Unitarian family, leaving America, becoming a new person. Eliot's family always expected him to come back to Harvard and teach in the philosophy department there. You could say that that rejection of the career that was laid out for him in America liberated him to become a poet. That action locked him into England. So in the end, he becomes even more English than the English because he is sort of aping a certain kind of cultivated English persona. He gets his, you know, umbrella and he starts dressing like the quintessential English gentleman and he works at the bank. So there was a positive side to the marriage. I want to emphasise that because Vivian was not an ordinary woman. She was very sophisticated, very well turned out, very beautiful if one looks at her early photographs. When he does marry Vivian, it's quite possible that, that he was a virgin in his mid-twenties when they married. And then as, as um, we've discovered, um, the adultery that took place with Bertrand Russell, one can only speculate how sort of crushing or devastating this would be. Now, what Vivian has been doing while Elliot was in America was hotting up what would be an affair with... Eliot's one-time teacher, Bertrand Russell. 
when he saw Vivian and Elliot immediately after his, their marriage, he offered his flat in London as a place they could stay. That here is a sensitive, um, slightly timid but daring young man who feels that he staked a lot upon this relationship and he was betrayed. And Vivian was meeting Russell and I think flirting with him. I'm not sure they went to bed immediately. He would say in later life that he couldn't stay with Vivian because she was, she'd become morally repugnant to me. I mean, when, when you think about the year 1922 and, and the imminent publication of The Wasteland and you think about how that came from Eliot's life and what he was living through at the time, so much of it is related to Vivian. There's much speculation as to the role she played actually in the writing of The Wasteland. And there's no doubt that Eliot wrote it, but she certainly had a hand in it. Yeah, so I think that the thing that is really important about Vivian is not so much Vivian as a first reader of the poem, although she did read it and we know that she added um, the line about what do you have children, Why do you, what do you get married for if you don't want children? She's had five already and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What do you get married for if you don't want children? But I think more than that, she created you know, the atmosphere um, out of which the poem came. When it comes to the wasteland, she feels it is part of me and I am part of it. She was also somebody who did contribute a lot of positive energy uh, to the wasteland. I mean, this was a poem that was created out of scraps, out of assemblages. Uh, it was brought together out of lots of moments that could have been dead ends or blind turns. And the fact that she, she does provide this... Uh, encouragement, writing, wonderful. So if the marriage produced the wasteland, um, you know, on one side of the coin, maybe the unhappiness is necessary. It's a necessary part of the wasteland. I think that is true in terms of their marital relationship. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow feeding a little life with dried tubers. I think the wasteland is sort of literary ragtime. It's, you know, it's, it's pop, it's, it's drawing on all kinds of culture, it's demotic, it's obviously reflecting the extraordinary events of the, of the, of, of, of the First World War and the things that have been done to the people of London and particularly by the war. What are the roots that clutch what branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats. The thing that it does that remains quite unique um, in 20th century poetry is um, a kind of commitment to multi-personal voicing, so that the, there are a lot of people who speak in the poem and they speak in their own idiolects, their own languages, often, and the dividing lines between those people are not clearly demarcated. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. I think I'd like to describe The Wasteland as a, a, a post-war poem, immediately post-war, that there's something about uh, the fragmentation of Europe that Eliot finds deeply, deeply alarming. You know, he was writing at the end of the, you know, at the end of the war. I mean, beginning in 1919, in a culture that was very attuned to the problems of waste, and where there was a sense that the one thing that the war had certainly done um, was to create wastage. You know, that huge areas of agricultural land in in France had been wasted. Obviously, millions of men's lives had been wasted. Vast numbers of horses. You know, uh, expensive equipment. Um, why had all that stuff gone? And the, and, the, and the landscape has been literally bombed, and, and he's responding to that. And it's, it's, it's an outstanding and extraordinary piece of... There's nothing, again, in the English literature, there's nothing like it. There are lots of reasons to read The Wasteland. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, read it preeminently as a historical document. But I don't think that that is how people reading it now or coming to it now find it. Unreal city. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many. I had not thought death had undone so many. <laughs> 
sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. That poem is, was seen at the time to capture a post-war um, moment. So in, in some respects, the poem is about the war. So you have women in a pub discussing their husbands being demobbed. You have uh, the, the references to the crowd flowing over London Bridge. And the crowd is a little bit like a dead crowd, a crowd of like, almost zombies. Um, and it kind of captures that sense that London at that time is a place where lots of people have come back from the front and they're either feeling spiritually dead or they're actually physically maimed. And, they, and that was the landscape of London at that time. Well, the editing of The Wasteland by Ezra Pound is one of, also one of the great stories of, of, of modernism and of the Anglo-American literary tradition. Um, and you can see the, the, the story of the editing of The Wasteland in the manuscript. He took out the bits that you didn't need. And he made, he, he found, as it were, the angel in the marble. So originally, uh, as you know, the, um, the wasteland was about twice the size. And Eliot gave the poem to Pound, who edited it. And he cut out huge sections of that poem. Pound had the confidence to know what to cut, which is quite a difficult thing to know. And he had enough confidence to do that. And Eliot had the internal confidence to accept it. Because many writers, lesser writers, don't like being cut. And it's, I've always felt it's a mark of greatness to accept willingly serious editorial intervention. I think in terms of modernism, which is this extraordinary uh, outpouring of artistic and cultural activity in the early 20th century, um, when old forms are really broken apart and new forms of expression are developed in all sorts of amazing and different directions. And this is a phenomenon that's not just happening in Britain, but you know, around, around the world, particularly in Europe. Um, uh, but of all the poets of that period, the person who really does stand out still is T.S. Eliot. It's worth remembering that when Eliot's, as it were, in his prime as a writer, writing the great poems, the wasteland and so forth, the dominant cultural, literary cultural group in England was the Bloomsbury group. And he knew Virginia Woolf. Virginia and Leonard had the Hogarth Press, which had published Eliot's poetry. And naturally, he was drawn to them. They, I think, found him rather, rather dull. They thought he was a bit of a stuffed shirt. And they, they, there are plenty of funny stories about how they got Tom Eliot coming to stay and what are we going to do with that? But he would have met with the Bloomsbury group people like Ian Foster, Maynard Keynes, and as a as a, a banker, he would have he would have he would have read and understood Keynes's sensational post First World War bestseller, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. I mean Virginia Woolf, who didn't mince words, who could say very daring and outspoken things, famously said that she saw Vivian as a bag of ferrets around Tom's neck. So although he launches this career as an avant-garde poet mixing in bohemian circles, at the same time he's clocking in, working for Lloyd's Bank. So this was his nine to, nine to five existence. Um, the routines and the duties um, that, that Supporting his family entailed paying for Vivian's medical bills. So their marriage began to disintegrate. I mean, all, m many marriages disintegrate, but theirs, theirs went spectacularly off the rails. And one has to say, in all fairness to Eliot, most people who knew Vivian found her intensity hard to bear just during a visit. And Eliot had to bear it day and night. I, I think he knew that he just had to leave and he'd been looking for an opportunity to do it for such a long time. Eliot's decision to take up the um, visiting professorship at Harvard in 1932-33, you know, really was a watershed and a remarkable decision when one thinks about it, to leave behind his wife for a whole academic year. Uh, and then while he's in America to instruct his solicitors to draw up a, a deed of separation. He didn't believe in divorce, but he did mean not to see Vivian ever again. Vivian absolutely refuses to believe Elliot is leaving her and she starts to stalk Elliot. 
at the Faber and Faber offices. She's making a scene at public appearances. He's wary of what she might do at a public appearance. He's not even safe in his office. For years and years through the 30s, he never knows next what embarrassing thing Vivian will do. He's very conflicted, I think. And the long period of the 30s, from the time he leaves her in 1932 to the time in 1938 when she is committed by her brother. When Vivian enters an asylum uh, in North London, Northumberland House, she does try to run away. It is against her will. Um, Elliot is not on the scene. In fact, I could tell from his address he was staying in the Cotswolds where Emily Hale was. The extreme amount of guilt um, that I think he felt about leaving this partner, coming back, staying away from her, not contacting her, um, but also the sense in which this might be his only way of saving himself and his, his own prospects for happiness. But I think the Virginia Woolf got it exactly right when she said Vivian was sane to the point of insanity. That seems to me to put it perfectly. She lives for another nine years there, and Elliot never sees her and never writes to her. And she died in the asylum uh, unexpectedly young in 1947 of a heart attack. It's such a sad end to, to the brightness that had been Vivian Elliot. So suddenly that sort of period has ended. He's a globally public intellectual with incredible stature. He talks in the 20s of what he wants to achieve in poetry, which is not for it to make a certain kind of sense as a story, but actually that it's the line of poetry that matters to him. And that, I think, is what you see in the four quartets, is the fruition of that ideal. I think there's long been an idea of the four quartets as a very different moment in Eliot's life from, from everything that's gone before. And I accept that that's true in terms of his post-conversion, his post-religious conversion um, experience, his uh, being single, his having approached middle age and thinking about things in a much more austere sort of way. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. It is a meditation on the, the desperate and unavoidable human need to live within time having glimpsed eternity. Uh, I think the other thing is the English literary tradition is rooted in the, it's Shakespeare comes in the landscape, Wordsworth comes to the landscape, Keats comes, and Coleridge comes to the landscape, Hardy, all the great poets are all landscape poets as well as everything else. And I think his love of landscape was his love of poetry. They are an imaginative immersion in the landscapes and experiences and ambivalences of his childhood. Here is a place of disaffection time before and time after in a dim light, neither daylight investing form with lucid stillness, turning shadows into transient beauty with slow rotation suggesting permanence, nor darkness to purify the soul. I see the four quartets as Eliot's masterpiece. I th it was the summation of the spiritual journey that dominated what is actually a very coherent career. Initially, I think he thought Bernd Norton would be a standalone poem, and then the war broke out, and he actually wrote the last three quartets, so it becomes a very different poem in the, in the context of that poem. We know that Eliot um, visited Bernd Norton with em Emily Hale um, in 1934, um, and there are these luminous moments in the poem that um, talk about lost possibilities. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been, and what has been, point to one end, which is always present. <laughs> 
So that when the marriage with Vivian really fell apart in some way, the, the sexual disaster of it fed into Eliot's sense of himself, he was deeply in love with Emily Hale, uh, in his American friend, and she was deeply in love with him, but she was so repressed that she reacted with horror when he suggested that there might be something between them, and he himself was clearly not very eager to have anything happen between them because of his own sense of, of unworthiness and his own sense of failure. It's been a long time since his great poetry of the 20s, and you see a long gap, and yet he's been very productive in other ways. And it wasn't until the outbreak of war and the closing of the theatres, a lot of Eliot's attention in the late 30s was as a successful commercial playwright. Um, so the London theatres close, and he turns to this deeply introspective, meditative poem um, that, that turns into the four quartets. And I think, I think it is true that these are oblique war poems. Yeah, if you go to Burnt Norton, and I've done this, with the poem in hand, you can walk through Burnt Norton, the poetry will lead you across the grass, through the copse, you know, up the hill, round the, the empty swing. You can just, all the things that in the poem can be found in the landscape. Now, the use that he puts to that as, a, as an allegory of his own condition is, per, it's a poetic use, but the landscape is unquestionably what he, his documentary. There rises the hidden laughter of children in the foliage. Quick now. Here, now, always, ridiculous the waste, sad time, stretching before and after. I think there's something haunting in that line in the quartets, ridiculous the waste, sad time, stretching before and after. Here is someone sort of giving up on the world of human beings, the world of love, the world of society, um, all those Laurentian values that, that, he, that he felt that, that Eliot had run away from. In my beginning is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble, are extended, are removed, destroyed, restored, or in their place is an open field, or a factory, or a bypass. East Coker, particularly, is the poem where Eliot is articulating his family's ties and relationships back to a landscape that in many senses he'd had left behind and to which he'll ultimately return. And of course, he did return to East Coker and his ashes are stored there. But equally, I think Eliot is cautious about the desire to place ourselves too carefully within history. Each of the quartets begins with something personal, but moves very quickly into the general, because this is great universal poetry. And what he's doing is laying out a pattern, the pattern of the spiritual life. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. And prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind, or the sound of the voice praying. And I think Eliot comes in the end, the last quartet, Little Gidding, to a place where prayer has been valid. It's a very tiny church not far from Cambridge, one of England's hidden places. Part of the extraordinary complexity and I think poignance of the last movements of Little Gidding are that they simultaneously acknowledge our need to be rooted, our desire to continue playing out the patterns of our history, our inability to escape from history. What he has written is about time and timelessness and as such it's about something much larger than himself. The communication of the dead is tongued with fire beyond the language of the living. Here the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, never and always. John Hayward played a very important role in Eliot's life, I think, especially during the composition of the four quartets. Hayward was a literary critic, a man of letters, and a very sensitive reader of Eliot's poetry. The two of them shared a flat for uh, a period leading up to Eliot's second marriage. And the correspondence between Hayward and Eliot really reveal the extent of uh, investment and just generosity with which Hayward read Eliot's drafts. And we have the drafts on which 
Elliot is asking questions in his correspondence. What do you think of this? What is working? You see him making changes in four quartets that are in response to John Hayward's suggestions. Um, he was the, the, the imaginative proving ground, I suppose, for those poems in the way that Vivian or even Pound might have been for The Wasteland. What you see in the four quartets is a fulfillment of all of the contradictions of Eliot. I mean, so if you can look at that poem as sad and melancholy, I think also there's a joy in the perfection of the line. You also find a fresher rhythm in it that, that suggests Eliot's long love of American popular music and even of the British musical. I mean, he writes that important essay early on about Marie Lloyd. It strikes me that he, he does what every great writer always does, which, which is to make very, very good career choices. I, I think he's, he, he, you know, he knew exactly what was required. You know, he, he became friends with the Bloomsbury Group because they were the hot group in town. I think the striking thing about Eliot to the people who met him in the teens and knew him in the 20s especially was the extent to which he seemed a person, as his brother Henry put it, a person playing a part. He never seemed completely at ease with himself. He was a man of masks, even his uh, closest friends, you know, people like Virginia Woolf, who know, knew him fairly well, said that they always felt they never really penetrated that mask. So this is who he is on some elemental level, a person deep inside himself, hidden behind a mask. One of the things I think we don't think about often enough in, uh, in uh, thinking about Eliot as the man behind the poetry, the, the, the man that suffers and the mind that creates, is the deep loneliness that I think he suffered all of his life. And I think that dynamic informs a lot of the honesty around sexual anxiety, sexual failure, the failure of communication across sexes, um, but also within them. Whether that mask is a way, again, of both revealing and concealing the isolation and the suffering um, that, that Eliot himself feels is, is, is an intriguing question. And you only have to listen to his re recordings of four quartets to hear that, you know, that voice. That's the, that's, that's, that's the image he wanted to project. Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. But behind that, in private, he was playful. You get the sense of a person who, whatever his problems, also has a great sense of humor. I think the other thing about T.S. Eliot, which gets forgotten, was that he, he loved the films of the Marx Brothers and late in life actually corresponded with Groucho. To think of Groucho Marx and T.S. Eliot being in the same room is, is a surprise, no less that they would have things in common or enjoy one another's company. Dear T.S., your photograph arrived in good shape, and I hope this note of thanks finds you in the same condition. I had no idea you were so handsome. Why you haven't been offered the lead in some sexy movies, I can only attribute to the basic stupidity of the casting directors. I've heard plenty of people talk about him, because when I was at Favour and Favour, there were plenty of people there who, who had known him. And they describe a shy, introverted, um, rather laconic character, but one who was given to great mischief and great... Fun. He was. He was. He had a playful interior. When you look further ahead, the real break in that mask seems to come in the fifties, uh, rather late in life, when he meets Valerie. Eliot won the Nobel Prize in nineteen forty-eight and was swamped with mail, and his then secretary couldn't cope with the demands of answering the first mail, and so he advertised for a new secretary. And the novelist Charles Morgan had had Valerie Fletcher, as she was, as his secretary, and he recommended Valerie to Tom as the replacement. What neither of them knew was that Valerie had had an obsession with Eliot since her teenage years. She'd read The Journey of the Major when she was 14 and had become obsessed, this is not too strong a word, with Eliot and his work. And she knew it by heart and she'd followed him. She was a kind of 
found groupie stalker, almost. She applied for the job, gets the job. When Elliot got together with Valerie, nobody knew that they were um, together in any way. It was a complete shot, even to John Hayward, who was living with at the time. He, she'd been working with him for about six years, so it, we, we don't really know at what point they realised that actually they were in love with each other. So there is something remarkable and unexpected um, when in 19, when a cold January morning in 1957, um, without informing um, very many people, including his flatmate, he decides to get married. They got married at the uh, at dawn at St Barnabas Church in Kensington and taken the, the boat train to the south of France. Nobody was to know about it, not even his colleague Geoffrey Faber, who was sent a letter he would only get after the marriage was a fair complete. By the time you get this, I and my wife should be well on our way to the Côte d'Azur for three weeks. I am marrying Valerie Fletcher, whom you know only as my secretary for nearly eight years. We are utterly devoted to each other, and I know that I am very fortunate. Elliot dreaded publicity at that stage of his life. He was incredibly famous. I mean, he'd won the Nobel Prize. He spoke from on high as the authority of the age. And he knew people would be startled by his marriage to a woman who had been his secretary. I think she brought something very special and fresh to his life, which had become quite crabbed, quite melancholy, and rather depressed. I think he was probably rather depressed by his loneliness. But I think it's, you know, it's not a stretch to say, you know, he is a changed man after that point. You know, he writes this poem about his wife that is almost sort of bizarrely sentimental and you can't quite believe this is coming from Eliot's pen. It's extraordinary. Of lovers whose bodies smell of each other, who think the same thoughts without need of speech and babble the same speech without need of meaning. No peevish winter wind shall chill, no sullen tropic sun shall wither the roses in the rose garden which is ours and ours only. But this dedication is for others to read. These are the private words addressed to you in public. And she, she, she cheered him up. She got him dancing, she took him to shows, take him out to dinner, got him to have a social life which he hadn't had for years. They would turn up at parties together and they would be clasping hands and all sort of all over each other and, and nobody could really recognise Elliot and he was so happy. But he wouldn't marry her until she was 30 because it would be improper to marry a woman under 30 if being the age she was. But once she was 30, they both felt this was OK. This is very charming but so old-fashioned. She reawakened the part of him which had died during the long marriage and during his long life, and his, of course his immense majesty as a, as a poet and critic and, and public figure of letters. So in the end, Elliot and Valerie had eight years together, very happy years. During that time, he was often actually quite ill, and she used to just to nurse him incredibly and stay by him. And, um, and then in the end, uh, he had emphysema and he died in 1965. I think there's no doubt that Lloyd Webber had nurtured the idea of a musical based on Earl Possum's Book of Practical Cats. It's got to be slinky, it had to be a kind of... Macavity, Macavity, he's called the hidden paw, because it all sets itself, it all comes from, you know, the way he spoke it. And. Lloyd Webber had enlisted support from within the firm because the firm controlled the rights of... Well, control had a, had a stake in the rights of the Elliott estate. And it was through Matthew Evans, the then chairman, that Andrew came to meet Valerie and played over the lyrics and the music of the musical. And she, to Matthew's astonishment, because Elliot had left this... Uh, restriction on the use of the exploitation of, of his work, work after he was gone. And uh, Valerie loved it and just said that Tom loved musicals and so the cats was, was go forward. You get the phone call from Andrew Lloyd Webber and his previous work has been uh, 
a story about the death of Jesus and then a story about dictatorship in South America. I thought, oh my God, what is it going to do? This is going to be the war of the worlds, at least. <laughs> or or, or um, the fall of the Roman Empire, yes? It's going to be something like And he said, do you think it might be possible to make a show out of Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats? <laughs> I thought, oh, God. And as we tried it out at my little arts festival at Sydlington, and uh, we invited T.S. Eliot's widow, Valerie, uh, to come. And after the concert, which she obviously liked, she said, there are these other poems. And one of them was a poem about Grisabella the Glamour Cat that had never been published because uh, Tom Elliot thought it was too sad for children. And that changed everything because then we had a theme of something to do with mortality and something that was highly emotional and consequently it was possible to create a story in the interstices uh, of the poems. The use of Eliot's poetry as the foundation of Cats is another one of those, quote, contradictions that people see when they think only of the T.S. Eliot of The Wasteland. The song Memory, which is the greatest hit, was really hashed up from a poem which we all read at school called Rhapsody on a Windy Night. And it's a mashup constructed by Trevor, Trevor Nunn. So the whole thing is a fantastic uh, mirage. I think it's very important to remember that in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 1950s, Eliot was a man of the theater. He worked in the theater as a very productive, very successful playwright. He had successes in the West End, he had a success on Broadway, and he was an acclaimed playwright. No, they used to, they used to go to the theater a lot when, when, they were, when they were sort of first married. And you can still see, I think, the, um, the, the, some of their theatre programmes. And he would annotate the, the, the programmes, or they would end together, recording their impressions of what they'd just seen, My Fair Lady or Beyond the Fringe or whatever it was. And she, so she was trying to keep... I think she wanted to keep him young and, and interested. I was at the first night of Cats, and I sat between Valerie Elliott and, I think, one of the Faber family. And I remember in the interval, after the first half... We all, looked other, we all sort of all looked at each other and we all shrugged. We had no idea whether this, we all thought well, it, was, it, was all, it was all very entertaining, but we couldn't see. If we'd known how well it was going to do, we'd have gone out and bought shares in, <laughs> but we didn't. And Valerie made a fortune from her. She, I think she had one or 2% and Faber's made money. So everyone, it all trickled down. There was a lot of money and the money was, was invested in, in, for me, in writers like Kazuo Shiguru, Peter Carey. You know, these are the writers who then went on to win the Booker Prize and to become part of the English tradition. So, that in a way, it was the Elliot money from Cats which funded the making of Fabers in the 1980s. So in some respects, I think Valerie's story is a slightly sad story. I mean, this was a woman who devoted her life to Elliot. She fell in love with him through his poetry as a schoolgirl. She married him and they enjoyed really a mere eight years. She then had 47 years of widowhood, during which time she tried to secure his legacy, editing his letters, producing the facsimile of The Wasteland, uh, and uh, working with Andrew Lloyd Webber on Cats, of course. He obviously needed to have a happy marriage. It obviously was something as though he couldn't die until he'd had it. Something he needed there. Uh, not only as, I think, a compensation for a sense of failure over the first marriage, because deep in him there was a need for family life. Somehow there was a good deal of little boy in him that somehow had never been released and came out in this way, I think. Well, he said, sort of half ruefully, he felt it had been like a Dostoevsky novel written by Middleton Murray. It's many reasons to say that a poet who died in 1965 and was so famous in his time that, that it's almost a necessary corrective to forget about him. And yet you come face to face with the wasteland. You come face to face with four quartets. You can come face to face with the song Memory and see something of what Eliot's genius was. And I think as many questions as Eliot the man raises about his character, about his morality, about his 
worth as a husband, uh, whether he was an anti-Semite, whether he was a misogynist, all of those are valid questions to ask, but we are only asking them because we are continuing to be entranced. Eliot's place in the English American literary canon is it's it's unique and it's it has a grandeur which is hard to you know, but I think the point about him is when he comes along, there's no one like him. He's okay, he's part American, part English, but he was based in England, and his his grandeur and his influence dominated the twenties, the thirties, you know, all the way through. And he still is the the poet who stands out amongst so many other poets as having done something important and meaningful. But ultimately, that's the test of a what Eliot would call a classic work of art, um, that it, it continually invites um, new interpretations, that new generations find a rapport with it and an interest in it. So it will have to survive on its own terms. I think people will always speculate about the relationships in Eliot's life. You know, he's a great poet, and so we, we do this with Shakespeare, we do this with everybody um, who's great. We want, to, we want to unlock the mystery of the creativity. And we think, ah, the first wife, that will unlock this. Well, it won't. All it will do is, all you can say is she was this or she was that. She had these qualities. He's a poet who's sensitive to feelings. It's bound to appear in his work. Whether it was autobiographical is really for the birds. Of course, it would be impossible to write poetry which wasn't in some way a product of very personal experiences. What Eliot is able to do is to translate those personal experiences into more uh, universal meanings. Of course, we're taught not to make a correlation between the life and the work. That's what we're taught. But I'm afraid it's there. You know, I, I hardly knew anything about uh, Mr. Eliot's works. I knew he had written The Wasteland, which is the history of American television. <laughs> and BBC, too. 